Hello and welcome to Biblical Perspectives. We are having conversations about various topics that we encounter as followers of Jesus and as people in this world. And the topic that we are covering in this series of episodes is how to handle the resources that God has given to us. Primarily, we are looking at our finances and our material possessions, but we recognize that those resources include time and gifts and relationships and all of these things. But, but what are some of the biblical perspectives for how to manage these things? This is episode number two, and I am joined as always by my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Frank Hosel. Frank is uh, one of the associate directors of the Biblical Research Institute of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. My name is Chad, and I am a senior pastor at Spencerville Church, and Frank is one of our members, and Happy we love you. doing this, right? Yes. We enjoy yes. talking. Oh, yes. In fact, I think, Frank, sometimes we enjoy the talking before the camera's on. Just as much. Just as much yeah. as the rest. So, so this week, I want us to talk about the idea of how covenants, the covenants that God makes with us, impact um, how we use the resources that God has given to us. And, and in the Bible, there are two types of covenants. There's what we may call a unilateral covenant, and there is a bilateral covenant. And, and why don't we start with discussing the unilateral covenant, the the universal covenants that exist, and give an example of one of those, Frank. Well, uh, in that case, uh, to uh, to illustrate that particular word, unilateral, means that this is the initiative of God, and this is solely His responsibility. There's only one uh, partner involved, so to speak, and that is God, and He decides to do certain things and covenants to do th certain things. Like, you know, he says, uh, I'll give you the rainbow uh, as a sign that there will be no longer a worldwide flood. And uh, he covenants that he will be with us and he will keep his word and that there will not be a destruction of that uh, magnitude until he comes again. So uh, that's, uh, that's something that he himself is responsible for that he himself carries through, that he himself guarantees, and where he is the only person to um, make that covenant with us and with humanity. And then there are bilateral covenants or, or uh, dual party covenants, we could say, uh, contracts as some people would maybe refer to them as. And, and why don't you uh, describe that? And then we're gonna look at some scriptures that, that um, give evidence to those types of contracts. Yes, and these other covenants uh, are covenants where God is active on the one side and uh, human beings on the other side are also involved. So we have uh, not just one person involved, but we have a partners, so to speak. Now, in these covenants, um, it is interesting that uh, God still is the initiator of the covenant. He is the one who, who brings it all about. He is the one who initiates it, but he wants to get in contact with us and he waits for our response. So our response does not establish the covenant. The covenant is established by God's initiative, by his grace, but he wants us to invite us to to be part of that covenant, and he waits for our response so that we become covenant partners in that. And our response impacts the, uh, I guess we would say, full fulfillment of that covenant, right? That's right, that's right. And an, in my opinion, an important uh, aspect of that uh, bilateral covenant is that God grants us human beings sufficient freedom to uh, respond positively or negatively, to accept it or not accept it. Yeah, it really shows his uh, magnanimity or his, uh, his graciousness in that he's all powerful. He's the initiator of the contract, but he doesn't say do this and you have no choice in it, but rather I'm giving you a choice. Yes. 
and and our and and our choice our response is always a response to his prior grace his prior activity of salvation and that's even with the covenant words the yeah. the 10 commandments really are covenant words in the old testament they are 10 words and if you read the 10 commandments you see that they start out i'm the Lord your God, who has done this and that, yeah. who has delivered you out of slavery. So he has freed us first, and because he has initiated that, he has... Uh, Asked us to live in this way. Yes, he says, now live as free people, and uh, this is what uh, I want you to to follow. That's good. Now, why don't you, let, let's just give some examples of, of the from the Bible of these these dual bilateral covenants. And would you read um, Deuteronomy chapter 28, uh, Frank, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 and 2. And then afterwards, I'm going to read one that's another famous one, but Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verses 1 and 2. Okay. I'll, uh, this is the famous passage of uh, the so-called blessings for obedience. And it says, And if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Shall I continue or is this? Uh, no, that's, I mean, so, so uh, the key word is there like almost that very first if, right? Mm -hmm. If then this is going to happen. If mm -hmm. you do this, then this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Another famous one is Second Chronicles 7.14. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Nothing wrong with that. No. If, <laughs> if you do this, then this is going to be the result. That's, mm -hmm. that's often the, the... If you're reading the Bible and you're coming to a covenant, if you want to know if it's unilateral or bilateral, the unilateral covenant is, is a text that I mentioned uh, last time. I send the, the rain on the just and the unjust. Uh, you know, the sun shines on the right, the wicked and the righteous. Uh, that's just God saying, this is what I'm going to do regardless of what you do. Uh, but in the Bible, as you're reading, if you see that if then, that's that bilateral mm -hmm. covenant. There's a God's coming to you as the king of the universe and saying, will you, yes. will you partner with me in this? Mm -hmm. will, you, mm -hmm. will you be my companion in this covenant? Um, now, this is important. I, I want to mention, though, salvation. Salvation is a bilateral covenant. It's not forced on anybody. It, it actually is given to everybody, but not everybody chooses to, or offered to everybody, but not everyone chooses to enact the, the benefits of it. Yes, it's bilateral, but we have to make uh, something very clear here. Even though it's a bilateral covenant where God wants our response, our faith response, it is always initiated by God. Yeah. So the covenant and his offer of salvation builds on his grace, his initiative. Without his first step, we could not respond uh, in any way. So it's not that we um, use that, uh, that our response somehow um, uh, makes it worthy uh, for God to, yeah. to, to be given eternal life or salvation. No, he gives us that in grace, but he doesn't force anyone. Love never forces, and therefore he waits for our loving response uh, in uh, that we freely give. Can, can I read you a passage and maybe we talk a little bit about how we keep that in balance real quick, just what you're saying there, because I don't want that to get lost. I know we're talking about mm -hmm. managing things, but you know how I like to do, uh, Frank, I like to go sure. wherever, wherever my brain wants to go. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that's the joy of this is that I get to like actually just lead the direction with the, with the theologians. Things that are not scripted. Yeah. <laughs> They're not scripted. Uh, Second Peter chapter one verses ten and eleven. Um, it says, "Therefore, brothers, we dad sisters, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. 
For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Frank, we know that there is a struggle when it comes to the covenant of salvation, of salvation by works. And a text like this is something that someone would say, okay, well, I've got to confirm and make my election, my calling sure, and only if I do this will then I receive the eternal king. Break this down and, and, and just give some, some assurance to people who, who, who tend towards a control of that. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yes, asking? yes, yes. Now here's a, here is a biblical principle uh, that, that I would apply to that particular question. Yes. You know, if you have a passage like that, never take that passage just out of context and isolate it from the rest of the chapter. Now, if you go... Or even the rest of the Bible. Or the rest of the Bible. Now, if you go in the same chapter one, yes. you know, same Second Peter, same author, same context, uh, verse three. Okay, okay. And verse three, that basically starts the whole discussion. Okay. And in verse three, he says, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now that's where it starts. Yeah. Now, if you leave that out, then you just focus on the verses you've, yeah, yeah. then you might get a distorted picture as if we, by our performance and by our deeds would uh, secure our salvation. But no, he puts that into the context of God's prior grace, of his power that enables us to do things for life and godliness, and uh, and he has called us to his own glory and excellence. So this is God's initiative that is his work, and that does not eliminate our response. You know, and, and here we are called to make a, a definite decision. We are called to make that firm, you know, but but it's not that we secure our salvation by that it's initiated and done first by god but even like when i when even as we read that passage i'm so glad you brought that his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness so that means that even the if of the the verses i read uh if you practice these qualities even that if of my choice is God's divine power working in me, empowering me to make that choice? Yes, right? and, yes. You know, uh, the Apostle Paul, another uh, biblical writer, a New Testament writer, in, in the book of Philippians, makes a very similar statement, actually, where he says, you know, that God enables us to wish and do things, you know, uh, and that he is the one who who makes that... in who makes us even want to do things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so this is, this is good. I, just because salvation is a covenant, I, I always want us, when we have an opportunity to talk about a true understanding of salvation, I don't want us to miss that. The gospel always yeah. has to be first, and the gospel, you know, this idea that God is Savior. And, a, and another implication of that beautiful truth, biblical truth, is, is because God has granted us that freedom, yeah. we are also responsible for our decisions. Yeah. See, and that, that's what we have to carry. I mean, uh, if, if I choose not to follow his invitation, then I'm responsible for my decision and will have to carry the consequences. And if I accept it in faith, then uh, I can accept his salvation by faith. Including our decisions about how we handle our resources. Yes. And the things in this world. Now let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Uh, that we were looking at before, right? That's where we were before in the okay. great chapter of blessings. Yes. Like said. Um, and Deuteronomy chapter 28, uh, somewhat, folks can read it on their own, 1 through 14, but there's some very clear things in here uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, 1 through 14. Um, but I'm just going to start in verse 3. You already read, if you faithfully mm -hmm. obey the voice of the Lord, you said that, if you obey the voice of your Lord God. Then it says, verse 3, blessed shall you be in the city and blessed shall you be in the field. In other words, wherever you work, it'll be blessed or whether, mm -hmm. wherever you live, right? Mm -hmm. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb, your children, the fruit of your ground, the fruit of your cattle, the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. 
blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall be you be when, when you come in and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies to rise against you, but they'll always be defeated before you. Um, the Lord will command the blessing on your barns and in all that you undertake. He'll bless you in all the land. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. thing after thing after thing. Mm -hmm. And the, the, <laughs> some people will say the question, and we know this, we, we have this theology that's out there called the prosperity gospel. And they use this concept of if then, within if you just do this, then God's just gonna make you rich and God's gonna, I remember I heard one preacher say, and I won't say his name, but I heard one preacher say, not of our faith background, but different, that he drives a Rolls Royce so that people can see that God has blessed that him. if you are faithful to God, yeah. then he will give you the most expensive things. Like even the most utter, largest things that you can never imagine. Um, how do we apply this general rule that if we do follow God in certain areas that he will bless our material things, but also accept that there's a not always? Yes. Talk about yeah, this. How do, well, this, this danger, this prosperity gospel. Yes. Um, that's a very popular trend uh, in Christianity. As I know in Africa, there are large segments and countries in Africa that, uh, that uh, thrive on prosperity gospel messages. And uh, people just think, you know, if you do the right thing, then you will um, be blessed, then uh, you will prosper, you will be rich. Now, here's the thing. There is some truth to that. Yeah. As with every error, you know, there is some truth to that. Yeah. The truth is that God is exceedingly generous if you follow the guidelines and the commandments that he has given. You know, he knows what we need. He knows uh, what will make us prosper and be uh, uh, healthy. He knows how to flourish uh, human life. So if you actually uh, follow his commandments, if you follow the instructions, the Torah uh, of the Bible, then you will experience that uh, this is a tremendous, generous blessing that you will experience in your life in many different areas, not just financially, not just uh, in terms of wealth, but in terms of health, in terms of spiritual health, you know, in terms of relationship that are healthy, uh, etc. So if, if you follow, let's just say the Ten Commandments, you know, you see the tremendous blessing that results from faithfulness yeah. in marriage, yeah. the tremendous blessing that results from honoring your parents and having family bonds, the tremendous blessing in society and in interrelationships uh, from honesty in dealing with each other rather than telling falsehood and lies yeah. and, and all that. And if you, um, if you work the way God has uh, told us to work, you know, to work six days, the rest of seven days, there is a rhythm to life that will make you prosper, that will make you strong, uh, that will give you health and strength and will lead to, to many good things. So there is truth to what the Bible promises here, and I can see that in the lives of those people who actually have practiced that and in their own lives. But there is something else as well in this world that we need to recognize and take into consideration, and that is that uh, we live in a sinful world, and there is an um, enemy of God who is trying to counteract uh, every good thing that he initiates. And... And there is something more important, if I may say, than prosperity and wealth mm -hmm. and rich, richness uh, and riches uh, in life. More important than all that for God is that we are faithful to him, that we love him. Yeah. And this could mean that uh, even uh, faithful Christians get sick. Yeah. It can mean that even faithful uh, Christians have to suffer adversity and poverty. Uh, you know, and uh, that not everything in life runs smoothly because the highest aim is not to drive a Rolls Royce. Yeah. 
the highest aim is not to show off, if I may use that example, how God has blessed me. Yeah. The highest aim is to give glory to God. Yeah. And uh, that gives it a completely different focus, I think. Well, and, and, and not only that, I think that one of the dangers of reading those if-then contracts in that way and focusing on the prosperity gospel or focusing on what God is going to do for us, then the motives of our heart shift. Because actually, exactly. what, we, what we don't realize is we're breaking one. one of those first commandments. We're creating an idol out of what we are trying to work towards. Yes. If I think then, if I think like, if I give this to God, then God's gonna somehow give me this, then no longer actually am I focusing on God, but I'm focusing on something else. And now I've inadvertently become an idol worshiper, right? Yes. But I, but I, but I focus on, you know, we give and we use our resources in a God-honoring way out of faith that something amazing is going to happen. Mm, mm, mm. We think about Abraham mm. and, and all of them. And the Bible says, you know, out of faith, he left his homeland and went to another land. And if you use uh, the resources in, an, in a God-honoring way, you will never just use them for yourself. Yeah, the always. You will use them also to be a blessing to others, to the less fortunate. Yeah. The poor you will always have with you, Jesus said, yeah. you know. So um, it's not that they will disappear. Yeah. But, you know, God can change things and he, he wants us to be compassionate. He wants us to be gracious to those less fortunate. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, maybe we will be in need of uh, some gracious acts of other people in the future. Yeah. And I, I just think, I think of some of these if-then covenants that relate to material things. And I think of them somewhat like the Proverbs. They're the general rule, but they're not the always rule. And we need to be mindful of that. Mm. And what I mean by that is like that, that there are people that are faithful with every dollar they spend and everything, and they're still not wealthy. There's, there's people that are faithful in their giving to God. They're faithful in their relationships and their marriages, but they still have a spouse die. They still have a spouse choose to leave them. You know, we have these examples, right? So God, so general, but... N- is that fair or is that yes, my yes, you know, but, but maybe it's also part of our, uh, how should I say, Western um, uh, American way of life and thinking that we think, oh, if I'm uh, wealthy, I'm happy. You know, mm. wealth does not guarantee happiness. And uh, pros- prosperity in the biblical understanding is so much more than just um, material things. It's so much more than just money. Uh, and riches, it's, you know, you, you can be, uh, in terms of wealth, you can be poor in the eyes of other people, yeah, yeah. but you can be very happy and content at the same time. Yeah. Now, that is not produced by money or wealth, you know, that is a gift of God and a way of, of looking at, at life uh, through the through the eyes of, of scripture uh, that you cannot buy that you cannot uh, get anywhere else but that God can provide so you can have uh, you know even difficult circumstances in your yeah. life challenging circumstances and yet you can experience a deep inner peace in your heart and mind you know and and things like that so there is so much more to life than just the things that we see in, in our Western materialistic consumer-driven yeah. uh, world. Ma- material wealth is a moving target. Uh, you know, in some, like right now, in, in our nation, we're considered middle class. Mm. We're not poor, we're not rich, we're in the middle. But in other parts of the world, I have a big house, I own land, I have two cars, I'm very wealthy, you know? But there's people who, here that we know that we would think of as extremely wealthy, mm. but mm. actually they're closer in ratio to us than say they are to Bill Gates or mm. Mm. Jeff Bezos or some of these, mm. you know, the creator of Amazon or what, you know what, get, get what I'm saying? Like, so, there, so, so wealth is this moving target. And I like what you said there though, that that thinking about wealth as something much larger than material is blessings. Just maybe if I could end by sharing this story, my grandma on my dad's side, 
she had like nine miscarriages hmm. before she had her first child. She had uh, a husband that abandoned her, disappeared for 21 years. Her second husband was in a car crash and was killed with her in the car as well. She was an artist in that car crash, damaged a part of her brain. She could no longer, I mean, not her brain, but like her eyesight. So she could no longer paint. She used to paint like china plates and mm. those would sell. People would take these, all these things. She lost her first two grandchildren and her first daughter-in-law were killed. Um, and I once said to my grandma, this was before I was a believer, I said, why aren't you angry at God? And she said, for what? And so I listed all these things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And her response to me was, why would I be angry? He's blessed me with so much. Mm. I have such peace. I have such love. For her, she, she had an abundance of wealth because you can't, the one thing you cannot take away is the peace exactly. and the love of Jesus in your heart. And sometimes we, we try to avoid the reality of death and you know these uh, challenging circumstances in life as if that should not be part of life. But that's, that's not how life is. You know, life is, uh, is more complex and sometimes we have to learn, I think, to deal even with these unfortunate and, and less beautiful yeah, yeah. aspects of life. You might be saying, what does any of this have to do with managing the resources that God has given us? It has a lot to do with it because as we, as we begin to talk more in the next episodes about managing God's money, managing the things that God has given us, we wanna keep all this in perspective. We wanna, we wanna be mindful that it's not about our prosperity or our wealth, but it's about the, the internal wealth of knowing Jesus, having the assurance of salvation, having the, the peace of mind, knowing that we have a God that initiates contracts with us out of grace and love. And the joy of salvation. And the I joy mean. of salvation yes. in that. So thank you for joining us this week, and I hope you'll join us for episode three next week as we continue to have discussions from a biblical perspective. God bless you all.